follow me here a little bit. One second. Ah, here we go. There we go. Nice. All right, good morning and welcome to the Williamsburg Community Chapel. My name is Luke Kincaid. I am excited to be here and worship with you all on this second Sunday of Easter, we like to call it. Obviously, last Sunday was Easter itself, but the Easter season continues on as we um, just gather and continue to remember the resurrection and let it guide the way we live. And with that in mind, we will be starting a new sermon series today um, called Sending. The hope is that as we experience and remember the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus last Sunday, that this week we remember that he sent us out, um, sent us out into the relationships in our lives that are around us, locally, globally, all sorts of places. And so whoever you're gathering with, we are excited to be able to do this together. And um, as you're gathering in worship, join me in the chat box. Um, I'll be in them, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, or our websites. I'm in all of those chat boxes and would love to hear from you, love to hear how you're doing as we enter into the worship service together this morning. Um, for me, my family, we were down in Chapel Hill, North Carolina for the past two days. Um, just, it was just a little quick trip at the end of my daughter's spring break. And so we went and gathered and got to see a women's tennis match and a women's lacrosse game which were both really fun. Um, North Carolina is good in both of them. And, uh, and it was also just a neat environment, great for our daughters to get to see them at that level of competition, which was really fun. So we had a great time down there. It was a little chilly, kind of like it is here today, same weather down in Chapel Hill. But just grateful for that trip, grateful for the ability and opportunity to go down there. And looking forward to worshiping together this morning. And so as we gather, I would love to hear how you're doing as you enter into the worship service today um, here at the chapel. In addition, um, if you're a college basketball fan, this is a big weekend for March Madness. Um, it is the end of both the women's and men's tournaments today and tomorrow. I've been following both of them actually pretty closely. And, uh, and it's been just great competition. And both the teams that are in the finals are ones that I uh, once the Final Four set was hoping to see there on the men's side, Purdue and UConn, my parents both went to Purdue. And, uh, and so it's exciting for my parents and some of my family to get to see them. I don't think they've ever won the national championship. I think that's right. Um, and so I'm cheering for Purdue. I don't know if there are any other Boilermaker fans out there. Say hello in the chat boxes. Let me know who you're rooting for in the men's uh, bracket. Also love to hear if you're who you're cheering for on the women's side. We've got an exciting matchup between probably one of the best players ever in Caitlin Clark of Iowa and then undefeated South Carolina. Um, and uh, it's going to be an exciting matchup tonight that I am looking forward to as well. And so let me know, who are you cheering for as we gather and worship today? Who do you have winning the March Madness NCAA tournaments? My bracket on the men's side is uh, was toast a little while ago. My champions... The two people in the finals got out two rounds ago. So I'm just cheering for teams now and looking forward to that. So if you are just hopping on in worship, we are grateful to have you here at the chapel. Let me know how you're doing as we gather in worship. And the way that works is through our chat boxes. You can say hello, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, or our website, and I'll see it. I'll type back. I'll say things back. And looking forward to uh, just gathering in worship with you whoever you're gathering with, wherever you're gathering from here on this Sunday after Easter, second Sunday of Easter. It's uh, kind of in the 50s here at Williamsburg, but it's going to be gorgeous. It's going to get up to 60, I think. And this week, it's going to be in the 70s, which I'm looking forward to as well. And so can't wait to worship alongside you. As we gather, just a heads up, we are celebrating communion together today. We would love for you to join us for that element. Love for you to join us uh, in that moment of the service, which happens after the sermon. And so after the sermon, um, we will be uh, celebrating that together. So you can just grab some bread and some juice, those elements that so wonderfully remember, help us remember the death of Jesus in some powerful ways. So join us. You can get those ready now. It won't be till after the sermon. So you've still got like 45, 50 minutes and plenty of time to get ready for that. 
So as you're joining in, just a reminder, we are starting a new sermon series today, which will coincide with our chapel-wide study. And so you'll hear more about that in our uh, service. Um, the chapel-wide study is something we do once a year. And, um, uh, and it's a chance for us as a whole congregation to be studying the same thing, thinking about the same thing, reading the same thing. And so we look forward to that as well. And, uh, and so if you're not in a group, we'd love to get you in one. You can contact Dale. You'll hear more about that later. All right. Our service will begin in just a moment. So I'm going to switch to our graphic. And then I look forward to worshiping with you. Don't hesitate to say hello in the chats. I'll see you in the chats as our service begins in just a moment. It's going to be great. See you in the chats. Good morning, church. Good morning, Tommy. Happy second Sunday of Easter. I know Rich gave you a welcome that you need a seat and a sheet. I'll just reinforce now that that seat can go anywhere. That's the beauty of being outside. Uh, but would you please stand for our call to worship? It comes to us this morning from Philippians 3. And in his letter to Philippians, Paul is reassuring us that our righteousness does not come from the law, but through faith in Christ, who has made us his own. And so we can rejoice. So together, you know what I mean, together, call and response, not in total unison. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord. He has He's made, made us, us his, his own. own. Putting no confidence in our flesh, no trust in our own ability to make ourselves righteous. We, we glory in you, Christ Jesus, and, and worship by the Spirit of God. The Lord is King. Let us, Let us stand, stand firm in him and rejoice. Let's sing together. <clears throat> on our song sheet that Easter greeting Christ is risen he is risen indeed hallelujah hallelujah let's pray together Paul closes Philippians 3 saying our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior Jesus Christ the Lord who will transform our lowly body into his glorious body Heavenly Father we give you thanks and rejoice for the assurance we have of Christ's resurrection, his victory over death. We give you thanks for our redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. And we give you thanks for your presence here among us. I know that Dale is going to share about how the gospel is more than past sins forgiven and future hope secured. It is your presence with us as you speak to us, as you feed us, and as you send us to share this truth with those around us. So please uh, make yourself known, knowing you as um, worth more, worth more than anything else the world can offer. Um,
please help us be attentive and, um, and rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Try it a third time. <laughs> wow, it's on. Our lesson this morning is found in First John, First John one one through two two. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it. And testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for calling us your children and for the gift of your son, Jesus. We come before you and ask forgiveness of our sins that we may be cleansed. You are the light. And we welcome your light to shine through us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. In this Easter season, a period of 50 days where Jesus appears to his disciples before his ascension, he uses the words, peace be with you, or simply peace. As we celebrate this season where we have been reconciled to God and to one another, we will practice passing the peace to each other. Think of it as passing on a prayer. As God has given us peace through Christ, we will give one another peace of Christ by greeting each other. And so would you please stand now to greet one another?
house is in Jesus. All my hope is His love, and I will go before Amen. You can be seated. A part of worshiping is giving back to the God who has given everything for us. And so in worship, we, we take time to give back to God, to give back generously to the God who has so generously given to us. There's offering boxes under the tent, under the portico. Of course, you can give online, through the mail, in person, but we don't give to somehow earn God's favor, but we give in response to what God has done for us. And to help us in this time of giving, I'm going to invite up all of our kids who are going to come up and help lead us in a time of giving. And I encourage you adults out there to sing along. The words are on your page. You can even join in the hand motions, but all the kids are going to come forward. Come on, kids, right up here. Come on. How you doing, Tucker? Awesome. Come on up, and uh, we're going to sing together. Thanks, kids. And now we're going to dismiss all of our children through grade five, if they want to, can head inside. 
for children's ministry. We're excited to open up God's Word with you. We have a lesson planned just for you, so kids up through grade five can head inside. And if you're new and you haven't printed off a security badge for your kid, parents, you can head on in there with your child. We'll make sure we get you a badge so that you get the right kid back at the end of the service. Um, As the kids walk inside, just a few uh, spiritual and financial updates for the chapel family. Uh, In March, we received 116% of our budgeted offerings. Yeah, somebody's clapping. We can clap for that. And that means that year to date, January through March, we have received 101% of our budgeted offerings. So we are grateful for Jesus' generosity that he expresses through your generosity as we give back to the chapel family. We give back to what Jesus is doing here at the chapel through you. And we are grateful that, um, man, we, we serve a generous God who gives generously. Uh, one of our uh, big announcements this morning is that this week starts our chapel-wide study. Every year, we try to get all of our small groups studying the same thing together. Currently, we're looking at the discipline of being sent, the spiritual discipline of understanding that God has sent us to proclaim the good news to the world around us. And so uh, members of our staff team and volunteers from our outreach team have put together a chapel-wide study that we encourage all of our small groups to be a part of. It includes uh, some QR codes and some links to some videos. I see Aaron Williams walking by. He's on a video this week, one of our testimonies. Got you, Aaron. You didn't know I was going to do that, but you needed coffee, so now I'm calling you out in front of everybody. But we've got chapel family members that have shared testimonies that we've put on video. We have different lessons and a great small group guide to think about how Jesus has sent us So often we think of being sent as heading off to a distant country, and we are grateful for our chapel partners that have been sent off to places that have not yet heard about Jesus. But the truth is, is that we are all sent into our everyday lives, into our workplaces, into our schools, into our neighborhoods. We are sent to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So we hope that we can... Um, learn that, be impacted by that, and practice that together as a chapel family in this season. If you're not in a small group, it's not too late. There's a small group kiosk that'll be in the foyer afterwards. We want to get you into a small group for our chapel-wide study. And um, just two quick dates for you. If you are a member of the chapel, especially, I want you to remember these two dates. The first one being that our annual meeting is on May 1st. That's a Wednesday. May 1st is our annual meeting. And we will be electing elders. There are three vacant spots. And so there are four candidates. And you can meet those candidates on April 24th. We'll have a meet the candidates night. We'll also have bios on the webpage if you can't make it so that you can be informed in your voting as we vote in some new elders in this next season. So May 1st, annual meeting, April 24th, um, meet the candidates night. With those announcements that I'm sure we'll all remember so well, um, hopefully you'll just get yourself in a chapel-wide study. That's the big picture. But I'm going to ask our scripture reader to come forward and read scripture for us this morning. Good morning. morning. Please pray with me. Dear God, we gather in worship this morning with such joyful hearts. We know we live because your son was crucified and rose from the dead. Holy Spirit, help us to understand that Jesus was with us yesterday. He is with us now, and he will be ahead of us waiting in our tomorrows. In your most glorious name, Jesus, we pray. As you're able, please stand for the reading of today's gospel. 
Today we'll be reading from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, gotcha. Okay, I'm I'm back. Okay, (laughs) thank you. One of the key themes of our annual focus has been that you'll never know who Jesus is until you follow Jesus where he goes. And so another key theme, I think, going forward, that's a corollary to that, is we've seen Jesus in the last couple of weeks. We've we've followed him to the cross. We've followed him to the grave. We've followed him him to the resurrection. And as we continue to follow him, we're going to learn that once you know who Jesus is, you follow him to learn who he is, but once you know who he is, you continue to follow him, but he sends you then as a witness of his restoration and his rule in your life. Um, as, As we come to know Jesus... We bear witness that he is resurrected, that that he is alive. And as we entrust ourselves to him as the ruler and the king of our lives, we we come to know him as the one who restores our spiritual life and our our health. Uh, He restores the image of God within us. So in in our passage this morning from Matthew 28, we we see this woman, Mary Magdalene, and she's the first recorded Uh, witness of Jesus' resurrection that that she was sent to actually tell other people what she had witnessed. I'm going to give the the big idea this morning, and then I'm going to take a little detour. But the big idea is that God sent us, God sent Jesus to save us, and he saved us to send us, okay? Um, I entered the kingdom of God through a personal relationship with Jesus when I was uh, 16 years old. And I, I tell you, it, it has been a remarkable half century. It, it's, it's really kind of crazy to me to think of a half century of following Jesus, but they, they've, on the whole, been very, very wonderful years. And one of the very first activities that, that I participated in as a brand new believer uh, was a youth retreat that turned out to actually be a youth missions conference, and I really didn't even know the difference. Um, As a brand new disciple, I I knew very little about the Bible, and I I knew very little about the Christian life. But that weekend, I went, and I heard speakers talking about 
people around the world who had never even had a chance to have a Bible or to, to hear about Jesus. And there, there was something stirring inside of me. It was this unmistakable and yet un unexplainable impulse that I was supposed to be a witness for Jesus in, in some part of the world where people had less opportunity to hear about the gospel uh, and that God was reordering my life. And I was to be a witness about that. Uh, initially, I thought it might be China and I thought it might be Japan. And over the, the years, the Lord led me on this sort of meandering path that eventually sent Celia, my wife, and Sarah, my daughter, Joseph, my son, uh, to Paraguay. Uh, but that was like 18 years after that first impulse that I was supposed to go to be a witness to a, a, a foreign culture, or a faraway place. Now, I cherish those nine years among the people of Paraguay is some of the most joyous and growing years of my life. However, the Lord used my father's death back in 2003 to, to send us back to the United States to be available for my mom, who was in quite poor health. Um, looking back, though, I, I see that even as a brand new believer, God I say blessed me with this sense that, that I was never just going someplace. I was being sent there to represent him. Early on in my Christian life, as I started to try to memorize some scripture and I had people pouring into me in some one-on-one -on -one and small group discipleship, I, I came across 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verses 17 through 20. Uh, if you have your Bible apps, you might want to look at that, uh, but I'll read it to you anyway. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, and we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So we have this ministry of reconciliation, this message of reconciliation. And, <laughs> excuse me. We are ambassadors of that message. You know, one of the beautiful things about an ambassador we see in, even in the life of Jesus is that Jesus is constantly saying in the Gospel of John, I did not come to speak my own words. I only speak the words that the Father has sent me. And as ambassadors of Jesus, that, that becomes our task as well, not, not to be spouting off all of our own ideologies and thoughts, but to, to say what Jesus has said. Now, back in the mid-70s, um, CB radios were pretty much the rage. Did any of you have a CB radio back in the 70s? A lot of you weren't even born in the 70s, but most people who were a teenager above had a CB radio. My dad was one who had a base station in the house, and we had CB radios in the car. And so my, my CB handle became the ambassador. And when anyone asked why, I was just absolutely more than happy to tell them about 2 Corinthians 5.20 and how Jesus was changing my life and I was going to be an ambassador of his good news. Now, in that time period, I, I learned about a ministry that many of you are familiar with called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I heard that there was this breakfast meeting. I think it was at Pop's restaurant over in Yorktown area. And there was a coach at Tab High School named Freddie Mitchell who led this with some other guys. And I, I went to one of those breakfast meetings because I thought it would be great to have a Fellowship of Christian Athletes huddle at my high school at Denby High down in Newport News. And, and so I sensed God send me to, to talk to Coach Freddie about FCA, and he talked that, that it could be a possibility. And so I, then I felt God send me to talk to the principal and the administrators at Denby High School to say, could we have a fellowship huddle here uh, at Denby? And they said, well, you'd have to have 
uh, a faculty sponsor. So then I felt God sent me to go talk to the baseball coach to see if he would do it. And within a matter of, of months, God birthed the first Fellowship of Christian Athletes huddle there at Denby High School. And, you know, not knowing what I was doing really was not a big obstacle. Um, I was so excited about what God was doing in me and around me, I didn't even realize that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, during that first year, though, there was no staff worker from FCA who came to Denby. Our sponsor hardly ever showed up to a meeting. Yet, God used this ragtag group of, of young Christians who were learning to love Jesus more than we even love sports, and we all love sports a lot. But he, he used us to, to bring three other athletes to saving faith in Jesus into his kingdom, and they now continue to follow Jesus, and a couple of them are elders in their churches, and we saw many other people come to hear and understand the gospel in a fresh way that they never had before. I, I say all this, Again, not to try to point to, to my ability as anything special, quite the contrary, but that God uses people that he sends even when they don't have a clue of what they're doing. Now, they just see themselves as ambassadors of Jesus, and they try to represent words that he says and the ways that he sends them. And so, after... Growing in Christ, God did lead me to be a pastor and with this, still this latent call to, to serve overseas in some other culture. Now, after 18 years as a pastor and 10 years as a witness of Jesus who was sent to Latin America, five years as a witness God sent to start churches among Spanish speakers in the Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, I've come across some personal observations and perceptions that I, I'd like to share with you this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Based on, on what I see in Scripture and what I've seen in the churches over these many years. And they all relate to the passage and the discipline of being sent. But I, I think there's some pitfalls that I would hope that we can maybe avoid falling into or if we've already fallen into them, that maybe we can get out of them. As I mentioned, God, God sent my family overseas to South America, and we went through the agency of the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. And that was made up of, of thousands of churches cooperating together, and, and they sent funds, and they, they supported us and maintained us and sent us by their generosity. And I'm, I'm grateful for that sending now I'm thankful to be a part of the chapel as we are also a, a sending church, uh, a church that sends people and resources to make disciples locally and around the world. And I'm particularly happy that we're sending resources to help send workers into North Central Africa where there are many unreached people groups who have never heard about Jesus and don't know the truth of the gospel. Many of them have never met a Christian. I believe that sending is a good thing. Uh, however, I fear that many churches, and here's the pitfall, I fear that many churches have come to see themselves as senders rather than as sent ones. And they view themselves as organizations that provide spiritual and community service rather than as an organism in which every cell of that organism is imprinted with the DNA of being sent as an ambassador of Jesus the King. And when a church sees itself as a sender rather than as a group of sent ones, those people who are not sent far away to some other culture, some other language, tend to see themselves as just not sent at all. They think, you know, that's, that's not my gig. I send money, I help support other people, but I, I don't do that. They believe that being sent is reserved for the special class of like elite disciples. But that's just not what I see in the Bible. As you look at the scripture, it shows us how the gospel spread like wildfire in the early New Testament and through the early years of the church history. And it spread from Jerusalem all around to Asia and to Europe and to Africa. 
And it, it was just ordinary people, not some super elite group of disciples, but people who saw themselves as being sent to these other, other places with the gospel. And my hope is that as we go through this series and study, when we hear the question, well, well, who is sent? That every single one of us would be able to say, I'm sent. And when we hear the question, well, where, where are you sent to? We'll be able to say, wherever Jesus leads me. When Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, it's, it's easy for us to hear that all nations part and just think, well, that, that can't be me. Uh, I, I'm not capable. Some of them may be a little older or infirm, say, I'm not physically able. I think I can't leave my aging parents. Others think I can't. Uh, leave my grandkids. I'm saying, I I can't pick up my family and my kids and take them to some strange place and possibly dangerous place. I mean, when when we we, we said we were going overseas to Pyrgo, we actually had people come up and say, well, what are you going to do with your kids? (laughs) We're taking them with us, okay? Uh, It it seemed to be a strange concept to some of them. Um, But we think, you know, I, I can serve in other capacities, but I'm just not this sent witness of the gospel, most English versions of the Bible translate that word in Matthew, go, as an imperative, as a command statement. But in the Greek, it's really not an imperative. The problem is, is it's, a, it's a particle of language that we don't even have in English, so it's hard to translate. It, it is a passive past participle of the word go. And so an alternate, more literal reading might be having gone, make disciples of all nations, or as you go, make disciples of all nations. Wherever you go, make disciples. And if that's the case, you know, the idea is to cultivate this intentional discipline of seeing ourselves as sent by God wherever we go. Now, we're always going someplace, right? Whether we're going to the supermarket, whether we're taking our kids to a sporting event or to school, or whether you're, you're, you're going to school, you're going to practice we're always going someplace. And you don't want to, to be weird about this and tell everybody, you know, God sent me to soccer practice today or God sent me to Sal's restaurant after church today. Uh, we're going to keep our same language. We're going to say, I'm going to Sal's after lunch today or I'm going to soccer practice today. But the, the key is to have this switch in your head. You don't have to tell everybody else about it so that you seem weird, but you think, God is sending me to soccer practice today. And God, God is sending me to Sal's after church today. I am a sent one, an ambassador of the kingdom of God. And if you find yourself saying, God, send me here today. And you say, oh, I can't say that. Well, then maybe you're where you're not supposed to be. So you may be sent right on out of there. Um, but the Holy Spirit is going to send some people far away where they'll need to learn a different language and understand different cultures, like when he sent my family to South America and he sent some of the people from the chapel and others to other areas that are now mission partners and and difficult places around the world. And the the truth is that I really hope that he'll send some of you young folks, some of your kids, don't get mad at me for saying that, but I hope he's going to send some of your kids to share the good news of Jesus and his kingdom to places where people have never heard. We still have like a billion people in the world who really have no clear presentation of the gospel. Many of them have never, ever met a Christ follower. And I think God is still sending people, even from North America, to take the gospel to those places. And as we go, that this good news of his kingdom would would be heard by people of God's restoration, that he restores lives and that he rules through King Jesus. But even if you don't go to those faraway, difficult places, I really hope that when you go to school, when you're participating in your sporting events, the arts, or at your workplace... (laughs) <laughs> Excuse me, that, that you will cultivate this discipline of seeing yourselves as sent ambassadors of King Jesus. You know, as we look at our connected world today, with all the mobility of travel and all the uh, internet connections here, one of the beautiful things about our world is we don't necessarily have to travel to faraway places to make disciples of people from faraway places especially in a college town and tourist town like Williamsburg, Virginia, where we have people coming like from Saudi Arabia 
and from countries where we're not even allowed to send people into. Now, I, I, I want to clarify that this first observation, perception about pitfalls, is that, that as the church, we need to see ourselves not just as a sender, but as a community of sent ones, as witnesses of the gospel. In that case, then the church becomes like an embassy of God's kingdom. We're on foreign soil, and we're representing a king whose kingdom is not of this world. It's, it's, it's a place that is actually not our final homeland. And this embassy becomes a, an outpost, if you will, of, of God's kingdom. It's not a hostile outpost, but it's an outpost of God's kingdom that doesn't try to take over everybody else, but it tries to invite everybody else. Hey, look at my king. Wouldn't you like to be a part of this kingdom that restores your life? The, the second observation has to do with knowing and communicating that message. We had the ministry and the message of reconciliation. So what is the message of an ambassador, a sent one? From the very first pages of the Bible, we see that God wanted those that he had created in his image to bear witness of his glory and of his rule throughout the earth, the entire earth. It wasn't limited to a land called Canaan or Palestine or Israel, but it was always meant to be to all the earth. When he talked to Abraham and he called him even about forming a people of his own, it was always that you might be a blessing, that you might bless all of the other nations. And so God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, rule over it as my sub-rulers. Most of us are aware of what happened pretty shortly after that. The first human beings rebelled against God's rule. And at that point, his image in them became corrupted to the point they could, they could no longer bear witness to his glory and rule faithfully. So before God could carry out this plan of his, his great desire to have the whole earth filled with his glory about his rule, he, he would first have to redeem and restore what sin had corrupted. He actually had to save human beings from themselves. On Good Friday, we observe that the, the Lord laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. Jesus gave his righteous life for our sin-tainted lives to save us from the penalty of sin. Jesus redeems. Last Sunday, we celebrated God resurrecting Jesus to life after being dead for three days in the tomb. And Jesus' resurrection showed him to be the living king who rules even over death. He rules the whole universe. In fact, he brings life out of death. Jesus restores. So God, God gave those who receive him as ruler this opportunity and, and responsibility to be his witnesses of his restoration and his rule. Now, as we get to Pentecost in a few weeks, we're going to celebrate that God gives us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and to make us more like him. From the inside out, the, the gospel also promises that the Lord Jesus is going to return one day and he's going to recreate everything and make all things new, including our bodies that we sang about earlier, including a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I, I'm concerned that some of our gospel presentations contemporaneously that I hear today are so focused on receiving forgiveness from our past sins and receiving eternal life in the future, it's almost, a, although these two claims are true, they're very incomplete. What, what happens to me now? Okay, I'm saved. I've been forgiven of my sins. I'm going to heaven and I die. But this is, this is the earth and the church are not holding tanks where God holds people before they go to heaven or to hell. This is the embassy from which he sends out ambassadors to tell the good news that Jesus is raised from the dead and he's alive and that he restores people to the image that God created them to have. So, as you and I bear witness to the gospel, a testimony that says, you know, hey, I just have so much peace right now that I'm forgiven, or I, I'm so glad that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. You know, if you're talking to a non-believing person, and you say that, it's going to have very little credibility or even meaning to them. 
if there is no life change going on in you about how Jesus and his rule in your life are restoring God's likeness, about how he's recreating you to become the you he created you initially to be. See, the the restoration that Jesus' rule brings to our lives points to this complete restoration when he makes all things new, including a new heaven and a new earth, and we get those new bodies that he promises. But from now, while we're here, our lives are to be pointing. Yes, he has the power to do that, and he started to do that. And you can see him doing that by this, this, this in my life. Now, let's um, look back to see this played out in our text from Matthew 28, 1 to 10. This is the first recorded account of the resurrected Jesus sending a witness to tell others the good news that he is alive. It was toward dawn on the Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and another Mary went to the tomb where Jesus had been buried. And there was this spectacular event in which there was an earthquake. The stone that had sealed the tomb where Jesus was buried had been rolled away. There was an angelic being sitting on top of that stone and When the the, the women got there, the guards who had been there to make sure that the whole body, uh, the body of Jesus was not stolen, they were, as dead men, terrified. And the angel who was sitting on top of the stone said to them, uh, don't be afraid. He sends them saying, go quickly and tell Jesus' disciples that he has risen from the dead And he's going to Galilee, and you will see him there. Now, while Mary and this other woman and other Mary were en route to the disciples to tell the disciples that Jesus was alive, the resurrected Jesus met with them along the way. And Jesus said, greetings. The real literal word there is rejoice. That was his greeting to them. Rejoice, my sisters. I'm alive. And Jesus also sent them, just as the angel had, saying, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, what what do we know about Mary Magdalene? The Gospels of Mark and Luke tell us that in a previous time, Jesus had met her, and she had been oppressed and uh, possessed by seven different evil spirits. And, And Jesus cast out these seven demons from Mary Magdalene, showing his power to rule over evil. His power to cast out evil spirits. His power to restore her. She became one who traveled with Jesus and the disciples and some other women. And Mary Magdalene was an eyewitness to what we've been talking about these last couple of weeks. She she saw Jesus in his ministry, but then she was standing at the foot of the cross by Jesus' mother Mary when many of the disciples had fled and were nowhere to be found. Then Mary follows the people who take the body into the tomb And she sees where they've laid the dead body of Jesus. And then Mary now is the first one to go and find the tomb has been empty as Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Now she's the first one to become a witness to say Jesus is alive and he wants to meet with you. You see, whom Jesus saves, he restores and he sends. Mary wasn't sent to give a big sermon. She didn't have to memorize a presentation. She didn't have to perform a miracle. She didn't have to do anything spectacular. She was simply sent to tell other people that Jesus was alive and that he wanted to meet them. Guys, I I think we can do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I believe that every one of us here is capable of being sent with that message. Jesus is alive. He is restoring my life. He wants to meet you and do the same. The big idea, God sent Jesus to save us and Jesus saved us to send us. We we simply cannot disconnect being saved from being sent. Now, after we follow Jesus to the cross, we follow him in the power of his resurrection. We follow him wherever he sends us. And he sends us as saved guys, saved girls, saved children, image bearers of God whom he has redeemed and is restoring what sin had corrupted in our lives. Then the church becomes this embassy of God's kingdom that puts on display what a community of people look like and whom God is restoring his image 
and his rule. This morning, I believe the Holy Spirit invites you and me to cultivate the discipline of being sent as a witness and an ambassador of God's kingdom in a foreign land. Wherever you go, to see the Spirit sending you to show and to tell that Jesus is alive and restoring your life. If you don't yet know Jesus in that way, if you, if you haven't entered into his kingdom, he invites you to do that even this morning. He wants to know you, and he wants to make you new. If you are a professing Christian, and you're claiming forgiveness for your past, and, and you're claiming that you're going to be going to heaven when this life is over from your future, but you're not living under Jesus' rule right now. You're not experiencing his likeness being restored in you. In fact, that may not even be on your radar screen, though you profess to be a follower of Jesus. Receive his invitation and grace this morning. To say, Jesus, I want to become that sent ambassador of your kingdom that you are sending me out to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you speak to us through it, that you speak to us through your servants throughout the scripture. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts and minds even in this moment. Lord, if there's some here today that have yet to come to enter your kingdom and to know the forgiveness that you offer and the restoration that you've paid the price to redeem them so that they could be changed and then to have the promise of a future being with you in the new heaven and the new earth. Lord, would you do what convincing needs to be done, do what drawing of hearts needs to happen, but do that the day we pray. If there are others of us, Lord, who want to boast in past forgiveness and future glory, but our lives have little to show of your changing power today. Would, would you please meet us where we need it most? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Dale said, God sent Jesus to save us, and Jesus saved us to send us. God sent Jesus to save us. This truth is evident at the communion table, that Jesus came to save us. And the truth is, we need a Savior. That the truth of the communion table is that we cannot save ourselves. So God loved us so much that he sent his Son to die in our place so that we could be saved. Scripture tells us that as we come to the communion table, we should, <coughs> we should take time to consider this truth, that we need a Savior, that we are indeed sinful. Scripture says to examine ourselves. So let's take a moment and examine ourselves and to confess our sin quietly before the Lord as we come to his table. Heavenly Father, we come to your table this morning acknowledging our need for a Savior. That we are indeed a sinful people, Jesus, and we are grateful as we come to the table this morning that we find forgiveness in you. Thank you for paying the price of our sin. Thank you for giving your life so that we could find life in you. Heavenly Father, May this table move us this morning as we take your mercy and your grace into our lives. In your name we pray.
Amen. Well, even as we consider our need for a Savior, we are reminded that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. There are words printed in your bulletin at the end of the first column on the second page, in the beginning of the second column on the second page. I'm going to read these words and you can repeat them back to me. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, as we come to the table this morning, the table is open to all those who believe in Jesus Christ. All those who have said, I need a Savior. I need Jesus. And as you come this morning, you'll be given a piece of bread. You can take it and eat it. Then you'll be given the cup. You can take it and drink it. And we do these things. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Likewise, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood given for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Gracious God, as we move to the communion stations around us, as we take your bread, as we drink your cup, Heavenly Father, may we be made so certain of our salvation through you. Jesus, may we know your grace and your mercy as we take your body, as we take your blood, and as we understand our salvation and our forgiveness given to us. Through you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may find the communion station closest to you. along.
every vow he broke in As we celebrate the Lord's Supper or Communion here this morning, it's our practice also to receive an offering for the Agape ministry that helps some of our church members in need and some in our community in need. And so those offering boxes are the blue boxes on the other offering stands, just to make you aware of that before you leave this morning. And if you would like some prayer this morning, if you have some questions, maybe you just want to try to process a little of, of what we've been talking about. It seems new or strange. A number of us just love to be around, available to, to talk with you, but we have some special prayer team members over with Scott and Jane Ickes over by the tree waving. We also have elder prayer on this first Sunday of the month where Kurt Kormanicki, and I believe maybe another, are going to be joining him if you'd like prayer for healing, uh, physical, emotional healing. These guys would be happy to anoint you with oil and to pray over you this morning. So, I, I leave you with a benediction of Jesus as he's talking to the disciples in John chapter 20. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Go now and tell of the restoring work of Jesus' rule in your life. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday after Easter. We are just grateful you're here. I was grateful that I got to worship alongside you this morning. I'm still in the chat boxes. If you have any questions, if you have any prayer requests, if you need anything, please just type it in the chat and I'll respond and would love to help or pray for you in any way that I can. As we head out today, just a couple things. One, as you heard this morning, we are in our new sermon series titled Sending. It's a great ser uh, series to follow up Easter, this great momentous occasion remembering the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And now we get an opportunity to respond to that by how we live our lives, being sent out into the places God has us to be. And so I'm looking forward to studying this along with you through our sermons, but also through our chapel-wide study. That's right, once a year, we ask all groups, all small groups, to study the same thing for just a short period of time. This allows us to really zero in on some topic, knowing that our whole congregation can be studying it together. So if you're not in a group or if you haven't started this study in your group, this is the week to do that. It kicks off today and it's going to be a seven week study and we would love to get you in a group. If you want to get in one, you can reach out to Dale South. He'd love to get you in, into a group. If you are, any, are already in a group or if you want to look at the material that we are going to be studying, you can scan the QR code on the screen or you can just go to our app and uh, right there in the bottom there will be a navigation to take you over to the chapel wide study and you can see all the different weeks and all the different videos from some of our congregants in there. It's going to be a great opportunity over this next seven weeks to study together, to read the Bible together, to be in prayer together, to encourage one another to be sent out 
and live for uh, those purposes that Jesus has for us in our life. So looking forward to that. Get in a group, if you're not, for our chapel-wide study. Well, this morning was the launch of our series on sending. So I hope as we head out this morning, your interest has been piqued. This idea of being sent people is intriguing to you and hopefully challenging to you as it is to me in my everyday life and in even bigger picture things throughout my life. Don't hesitate again to say something in the chat boxes. If you want to connect here at the chapel, we'd love to get to know you. You can fill out our connect card by scanning the QR code on the screen and that'll just give us the information we need to reach out and talk to you further about getting you plugged in here and uh, whether it's a group service or anything here at the chapel. Thanks again for joining us. I hope you have a blessed rest of your Sunday and we can't wait to see you again soon.